Hello and welcome to the Business of Betting podcast. Today I'm joined by Roxy Roxborough. Roxy, thank you very much for coming on. Before we get into this episode, make sure you follow us on Twitter, at BettingPod, and check out the website, businessofbetting.com. Guest suggestions are much appreciated. This podcast is proudly sponsored by Betfair Proprietary Limited. Betfair operates a betting exchange and is licensed in the Northern Territory of Australia. Residents of Australia can join Betfair by visiting betfair.com.au and support this podcast by using promo code BOBPOD. Please gamble responsibly. So thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy this episode of the Business of Betting podcast. Today I'm joined by Roxy Roxborough. Roxy, thank you very much for coming on. My pleasure, Jake. So, Roxy, most people know you as an iconic figure in, in certainly sports betting in the United States. But before we get into that, tell us about how things started for you in, in British Columbia growing up. Well, like a lot of people in my generation, uh, my first um, introduction to legal gambling was at the racetrack. And my father took me. Um, and I don't think that's unusual for people in their late 60s. Um, and that was my first introduction. And then uh, I also um, was a snooker player. So between the racetrack and uh, pool uh, rooms, that was basically where all the bookmakers and gamblers would hang out because this is uh, no casinos in North America except in uh, Nevada. It wasn't even a lottery. Uh, some places had some loose card rooms. But basically, gamblers hung out at the racetrack and they hung out in pool rooms. Was horse racing your first love or were you a sports fan growing up as well? Well, actually, horse racing, I had no interest in it until I started gambling on it. Uh, absolutely no interest. So I, I was a sports fan growing up. Uh, and, of course, all the regular American sports, particularly baseball. I think that's probably true for most. If there was no gambling on horse racing, I'm not sure how many people would <laughs> attend the tracks or a place of, a, you know, a pick six or a quaddy or whatever it might be. So how long for you did it take for, for Vegas to come calling? Well, I sort of got pushed out of Vancouver. Um, I, I had been to Las Vegas in uh, 1972 and 73, and then I went back up to Vancouver, and I was a, a small-time bookmaker up there working out of a, uh, on Friday afternoons, working out of a uh, mining stock uh, brokerage, which was great for gamblers because everybody who was in the mining stock business then probably still today. It's a big gamble. And uh, the police had picked me up a couple of times, but they have better things to do than uh, bus bookmakers. But after the second time, they said, look, Roxborough, next time we're going to have to prosecute you. And the only logical thing seemed to be for me is to move to Las Vegas and uh, I, I got to Las Vegas permanently in 1975 and uh, started my career as a better um, in Las Vegas, which was a, a lot different than bookmaking. But uh, there's, I've always thought that there's money on both sides of the counter. So uh, I bet for about five or six years. And then my business took a strange turn into odds making by accident when I was in the Club Calneva in Reno. Uh, Chris Andrews was running it at that time. He's the youngest uh, sports book director in the state. And he asked me if I wanted to help him out on some baseball totals. So normally that wouldn't be something you'd want to do, help a bookmaker if you're a player. But back then, uh, the, there was no communication between Reno and Las Vegas. They were totally separate markets, and I decided to do it. And uh, one step led to another. And then I think in 1982, I had to make a really critical decision whether I wanted to be a gambler or an odds maker full time because it wouldn't be that ethical to sell casinos odds and then bet them. And then I said, well, I'll be, try an odds maker for a year or two and we'll see where it goes. And then it ended up my, being my career for the next uh, 20 some years. Wow. So take us back to the betting days. Were you able to make a living betting baseball full time? Yes. Um, I actually, I wasn't very good at other sports, uh, so the, this presented two dilemmas. Uh, baseball season is a very long season. It goes for a couple hundred days, and that's, that's the good thing. Uh, the other thing is, it's, I've always told people this, and that a famous 
breakfast at uh, in Sydney years ago with uh, Jelko, um, we talked about and his insistence that anybody can win betting small. The real challenge is in scaling it up. And when I was betting in the late seventies, early eighties, there just you just couldn't bet a lot of money. A two thousand dollar bet on a baseball total was really large, and you probably needed somebody to help you make that bet, which means you were probably only getting half of it. And if you ran around all the casinos in town, they'd give you three hundred or five hundred dollars. So, could make a living? Yes. Uh, could you make a living where you were going to? Um, have two cars move into a fancy house in uh, the suburbs? No. I've been told the tax rate back then was, or prior to that even, was 10% tax on handle, and then it developed and dropped to 2% and, and to what it is today now with a quarter percent federal excise tax. Take us through the evolution of that and what impact it had on Nevada especially. Well, when it was 10% of the handle, obviously nobody paid it <laughs> because you couldn't pay it. <laughs> Uh, only some, sometimes some tourists would come in or they, or, uh, and they would pay it or, uh, even people would pay it on a horse racing if you think about that. So, you know, it, it, it. so what, what happened is it made almost every legal bookmaker in Nevada an illegal bookmaker because they would take the bets, uh, either under the table or they would write you a ticket understanding that uh, the ticket was for 10 times the amount written. So this was not viable, and that's why the sports betting business really not didn't get large. Uh, in, in the mid-'70s, the handle on uh, sports betting that the federal tax had down to 2%. The casinos saw an opportunity to get in the business. It still is a big chunk of uh, profits, because if sports handle wins five percent and two percent, you know, and they're paying two percent on handle, that's. But casinos saw this as a better demographic uh, for the casinos and a better market to get into. And then when it was reduced again to one quarter of one percent, then you really saw the industry explode because uh, then you could use short prices on baseball and you could uh, be competitive. Actually, you could outdo illegal bookmakers. Um, there was a time in Las Vegas, even when the tax was 2%, illegal bookmakers in Las Vegas were bigger than legal bookmakers. So there's no question that the reduction in taxes had a uh, great deal to do with, with the growth. And um, people saw opportunities. And, of course, the biggest thing in 1976, Union Plaza became the first casino hotel in Nevada to have a sports book, and then it, it, the business just took off from there. So for those who aren't aware, what's the difference between, you mentioned it before about odds making and typical bookmaking? The way that we did it in Las Vegas was a, a little bit uh, different um, than other uh, countries done it out in the world. Basically, there's odds makers, uh, which our company was, Las Vegas Sports Consultants, would sell the odds to the casinos. Uh, now, the casinos would have... Uh, their own guys that would tweak the line or, or change it a little. Uh, but basically, they farmed out the odds-making business uh, to us. We were sort of a central clearinghouse for information on weather, injuries. We developed the first computer programs uh, to be used in odds-making. And so the casinos thought it was worth it to buy the odds from us. Uh, but we had a Nevada gaming license, so there was integrity in the product. So their job, basically our job was to make the odds, and their job was to book. And um, uh, so that, that's the way it, the business evolved in Nevada. So take us back to the day you realized Las Vegas Sports Consultants was a good idea, or the day you started. What was the industry like at that moment? And then obviously it, it started to shift pretty quickly, I would imagine. Well, it did. Actually, I... I made a lot of miscalculations in my life, and I actually, uh, when Las Vegas Sports Consultants started, I knew I was giving up a, a living uh, betting sports for less income, but I thought it had some potential uh, if more casinos got sports books. But it wasn't a given that every casino was going to have a sports book. So I miscalculated the growth. Um, but the growth was great for our business, obviously. And then uh, a partner of mine, Vic Salerno, um, uh, started opening the, like franchise books, 
like the McDonald's of bookmakers called Leroy's in Nevada. And um, I was a second largest shareholder in that company. So then for a while, then I was odds maker and bookmaker at the same time. Uh, but I couldn't foresee that it would grow as much as it did in Las Vegas. I just thought there were limitations and some places wouldn't be interested in sports betting. It turned out that every casino had to have a, uh, a place to bet sports. But I, I couldn't read that when I got into the business. Before you started using computer programs, was it, mm-hmm. was it people sitting in a room with a pencil and a pad and writing down all of the major factors in a match or in a, in a game and then coming up with a number, I guess, manually using you know, intuition and things like that? Or what was it like back then before the computer rating systems and things like that started? Well, it was uh, sort of hilarious. If you think back on it, it was a, a whole office full of loose leaf uh, notebooks with colored pens, with everybody uh, putting their own ratings and 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 and, and data uh, from the matches uh, in these uh, notebooks. And we, you know, we have storage rooms full of them. The first computer I got was called a it was a Radio Shack TRS-80. They called it a Trash 80. This is in the Around the, I think around 80 or 81, and the first thing we used it for was to store uh, data so we didn't have to keep entering all the data um, ourselves. And we, that was a massive um, uh, time saving. And then bit by bit, we learned that you could uh, do some programming and you could do some data search and you could do some data mining and then we were actually used pretty simple power ratings back then. Uh, we didn't have any regression analysis, any um, Monte Carlo uh, uh, runouts. We just basically were looking at strength of schedule, uh, score differential, and uh, came up with figures that were actually better than the uh, figures that we were using. But compared by today's figures, they you know, they would be really uh, Stone Age stuff. So take us through the, the actual business and how it worked. Did you come up with lines, let's say, a day or that day of a match or a game and then physically send someone to a sports book and say, look, you know, this is the, this is the dime line on a baseball match or this is, the, this is the NBA match of the day prices or how did it actually work? Well, the, it actually started, um, we would do this, Individual sports, football, we do uh, a week at, you know, um, five days before the matches. The individual sports like basketball, hockey, and baseball, we'd, do, we'd send out the morning at around 8 a.m. Actually, the, the technology really uh, made a big difference in the distribution of the odds, too, because we used to uh, just, people used to call in the office when they were ready and they'd get the latest, the latest odds when they were ready to open. And then we'd, uh, I bought a, a fax machine, I think. I can't remember when I bought it. I thought it was a stroke of genius. And what happened is uh, some stuff was just too cumbersome to read over the phone, like future book odds on 200 teams to win the college basketball tournament, et cetera. And it turned out that none of the sports books had fax machines. And the stuff was getting routed through the executive office and being sent downstairs a day later in the office mail. So that, that, that didn't work out until we had to uh, buy fax machines for all the sports books. And then it evolutionized into um, online printers uh, where we put phone lines into the sports books with uh, printers and little bells on it if there was an emergency or a game need to be adjusted. And uh, the sports books didn't want to do that. We had to buy the printers for them. <laughs> Basically, we, we kept pulling the sports books into the technology area you know, when you have a monopoly, you're, you're not that innovative. And then uh, we went to vertical blanking, satellite feeds. Uh, we partnered with a company called Data Broadcast Corporation that uh, did stock markets, uh, real-time stock market information. We sent our odds out over FM signals. And uh, so this, this could make it real-time and we could send it anywhere. But we uh, we had to buy them the computers because they didn't they didn't want to buy the computers, and then uh, eventually the internet made the playing field level. The internet changed everything because we had a 
basically a monopoly on how we could deliver odds. Nobody could deliver it the way the amount of ways we could in real time because we're partnered with a stock market company. And the time that the stock market is down is the time when all the sporting events are on, which is weekends and evenings. So uh, it was a marriage made in heaven. But the Internet, that leveled everything. Um, so we had to take it a step further um, after the Internet. Was it a two-way partnership with the sports books? Were they feeding you, you know, line move information or or some other things that you wouldn't necessarily have direct access to, so you could have better lines and and be better at the odds making part of it? Yes, they they we did get that feedback, which was uh, terrific. And uh, but then it even the next step we got the internet. So since everybody could have a line service reporting business with uh, internet and so, sort of uh, live feeds. So we went to the sports books and we got the sports books to. Uh, we went into the sports books and actually looked at their live feeds, real time, every move they were making, and then we were able to put it out on a computer screen. So we were actually uh, the originators of of, of the uh, real time sports odds because we had exclusive contracts because we had a Nevada gaming license to tap into their their uh, betting odds and see them move. And then we displayed them to the rest of the customers so they could track line movements. Obviously, sports books that take larger bets, the, the lines have a little more credence and sports books that take less bets. And that, that became obvious to the other bookmakers, too. How localized was the Nevada market at that time? You mentioned before that Vegas versus Reno wasn't even competition. Did it continue like that for a while? Because obviously now if lines move in London or or Sydney, or wherever else, then it reverberates around the world very quickly. Back then, was it a pretty much Vegas Strip market only, or Nevada only? Well, we were also a clearinghouse for other illegal bookmakers around the country that would call somebody in Las Vegas and would make a bet. So that's a federal law violation, but it's not exactly something somebody gets convicted for. Um, so we did have that type of betting too. So in that sense, we were connected to the illegal bookmakers and then some international arbitrage players started to surface originally on things like Wimbledon and, um, and then on, uh, other events. Uh, and then they, when London casinos and sports books started using NFL football, these international arbitragers would, uh, push the price together, and then there was a reason for us to have a closer collaboration with English sports uh, books, and we had a, agreements with uh, William Hill and Ladbrokes. We'd start exchanging information, and it was good for both of us, and also gave us a chance to present odds that normally we wouldn't uh, uh, present in uh, Las Vegas. And I think you've, you've st- it's still happening today if you see a tremendous out. out uh, growth in uh, international soccer. And that's, that's one of the reasons is because you have the ability to check uh, uh, prices from around the world before we put up our own. So compared to today, certainly, it sounds like there was a lot more bookmaking going on in the sense that you probably had a line or a price that you were receiving from you and your team. And then from there, you might have been largely on your own for hours at a time, even before you got any updates or changes. Well, that's true. Um, and the old school was you just moved it when you got bet. The, they believed in the line. They believed in the opening line. And um, over time, we were showing data that the uh, to the books that the closer you were to the... The, the final score was uh, proportionate or correlated to the uh, closing odds. And then so people got... The bookmakers got a little more interested in line movement. And they were on their own unless it was a major injury, and then we had to try to call 30 sports books on a telephone all at once. And, of course, you can't do that with a staff of seven. And eventually, we, you know, I ended up with a staff of about 29, but that, that's another story. But uh, So that's why this electronic uh, beeping system that went into the sports books would uh, tell them that there was something wrong uh, with the game or a player was injured. But... Um, School now is that all the bookmakers are looking at the screen. You know, they're looking at the odds from around the world. So uh, it's a different game. You know, players bemoan it because they think nobody books anymore. They're just moving the, the uh, numbers without bets. But point of fact is it's more profitable for the bookmakers to be doing that. 
So how did you, with seven other colleagues, potentially book every or make odds on every baseball game, basketball game, football game? You know, it sounds like... Yeah, we usually had three or four people um, in each sport. Some people were... I, we had rating systems for the individual odds makers to determine how accurate they were. And some guys were good at some sports, some guys not so. And we we do some outside consultants, uh, especially in hockey, which hockey wasn't a big betting sport in uh, Las Vegas for a lot of years. So we'd use some outside people, too. And basically, the odds manager was the guy who had the last say. There'd be a round table of guys making odds, and eventually we have to settle on one number. Everybody would make their case, and then we'd have to settle on one number we would send to the sports books. It was an arduous process. It took a lot. To, it would take a lot of hours to, to produce, the, produce the line. So I'm not sure if you were even involved in this aspect, but today, what's called risk management? Did you ever advise or help the the bookmakers with, you know, if a sharp player came in every Saturday morning and bet Ohio State from mm. minus six all the way to seven and a half, let's say, and kept winning, would you ever get involved in that, or, or what was the approach back then to those types of things? Well, we didn't get involved with their individual customers because only they knew who they were. But what we did is we uh, came out with a uh, a monthly newsletter on better ways to move the line and how much profit they were really getting on some of the boxing lines they were using. It wasn't as much as they thought. Uh, and I wrote a book on race and sports management. I wrote it first time in 88. I think it was updated twice. Um uh, but it showed the mathematics and how the nothing is really carved in stone. Although the 11 to 10 mathematics are carved in stone, there's bets that we offer like teasers where the where the uh, range keeps moving and the odds need to keep getting adjusted, and you can't be frozen in the past. So we tried to educate the industry on uh, on macro trends on bookmaking. So how did you develop that knowledge base? Was there enough information flowing through Nevada at that time to be able to get different perspectives and experience? And I guess the illegal market was probably still flourishing. Was that a, a source of a lot of that information? No, I went out and hired my own mathematicians. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we, we, that's, we, we had uh, uh, a statistics professor at... Uh, um, at Cal Berkeley, we had a. I had a a, a dream graduate uh, for me who had a double major probability theory and statistics, and he loved sports betting. He worked for, for me for a while, and now he's a professional gambler. I had another guy work for me was an engineer at uh, Penn State. Uh, they were all kids when they started, and every time every time I brought somebody in like this, they had a better understanding of the of mathematics and statistics. And they would look into the data and the computers, and they they do a lot of a, a lot of fine tuning for us, and uh, it was sort of invaluable help. So, looking back now, what was some of the key things that made you so successful at LVSC? Was it a combination of things and luck and timing to enter the market, or were there other things that stand out? Well, a lot of a lot of life is is luck. Um, I mean, when I got into the business, I thought it was something to do for a year or two. And as I told you earlier, I miscalculated totally how big the business was going to get. So we grew with the business. So it was a pretty good ride uh, for the, from 1981 till I sold my company and left in 99. It was just a steady uh, period of growth and sportsbook handle and new casinos opening the business. Uh, so that's lucky. And surrounded myself with really good people. I, I think uh, when you run a business, you really have to understand what your uh, what your weaknesses are or where you need help. And kids kept getting smarter. Every every generation of college graduates gets smarter. Every four years, every college graduating class is smarter. So um, we were able to tap into these guys um, before you know, for small money because they'd just gotten out of college. We knew they couldn't stay with us for a long time, but um, they were able to add a lot of value. I think that helped us immensely too. But I think, it was, you know, the it just, 
one of the best things in life to do, I, I think, is to get into something that you can make a living at, and you like to get up every day and do it. And so that's, I'm pretty fortunate that way. So what ultimately led you to sell? Well, <laughs> uh, when I looked around one day and I realized I had more guys um, in the tech department than I had in the odds making department. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we had we had like at the end I was also had a uh, computer uh, sports world that evolved into uh, Vegas Insider. I was supposed to be running that too, which I really had no interest in. But that was our data source. So I looked around and I've got all these uh, data guys which we need for odds. But then we had all these tech guys because we had to service all the casinos with our equipment. We had to make sure the fees were running. It was a 24 hour day a job. And I, and the, the irony is that uh, data, we didn't need as many odds makers with the computerized uh, data. Uh, so I looked around and said, you know, this isn't an odds business anymore. It's a tech business. And I sold it to another tech business. And, uh, I, wrote myself, they gave me a three-year non-compete, I changed it to five years, because I really didn't want to get back into business, I want to take the next stage of my life, and uh, so then I moved on. I still bet today, because you can't get out of the business, I mean, it's, you know, I, I still bet on baseball and, and English soccer, but uh, baseball, because I love it, and English soccer, because you can bet a lot of money, but uh, I really, um, I wanted to make sure that I didn't get back into business. So did you have an itch to get back into bookmaking at that time? I know you said you had a non-compete, but what was the yeah. next step or the you know the direction you took from there? I switched to finance. <laughs> so uh, because I had some people with computer knowledge, and this was be about '99, started doing some international bonds, and uh, you know what? It, it's hard to explain that when you're working in sports betting, it's even though it's a big worldwide industry, there's really, you can't scale it up like you can in the financial markets. So it's a totally different business as far as scale goes. Um, uh, and I've run the, some family trusts. But basically now I can say that I'm happily doing nothing, um, that despite what people tell you, it's uh, doing nothing is a complete day and you wish you had more time. Let's talk price. Unlike bookies and totes, the Betfair Exchange is a low-margin, buy-sell, fixed-odds marketplace where the value stays with the punter, not the house. Ready for the game within the game? Join betfair.com.au. Gamble responsibly. So take us back to the early 1990s and something called PASPA appears, which mm -hmm. is the Professional Amateur Sports Protection Act, which essentially didn't allow any other states other than Nevada and a few other smaller states, Montana, Delaware, and Oregon at the time, to continue sports betting. But there was a grace period, and states like New Jersey were interested. What was the feeling, and what was happening at that time? Well, one of the things that uh, precipitated uh, PASPA was that I worked for a company, we were consultants for a company called GTEC, that was this, uh, this is large, uh, lottery company that really dominated lotteries in the U.S. I think they uh, provided the uh, equipment and the software for 32 of the states in the U.S. And their idea was to have a, a sports, an NFL football parlay card run by the lottery in every state. And we actually opened it in Oregon. And then all of a sudden the league stepped in and decided they didn't want this. And they, they helped um, put this legislation together that uh, grandfathered uh, Nevada. I thought at one at that time maybe that the growth in our business was over. I was that's another miscalculation I made, but it would have been humongous if if uh, G Tech had put these football parlay card games into uh, all 32 states. Um, it didn't happen. Perhaps gave uh, New Jersey a golden um, opportunity to uh, have a legalized sports book and political reasons. They had a year to pass. Uh, pass it, the state legislature, they didn't. I was convinced that uh, New Jersey would lead the way in sports betting, that we were going to have to move our office there because it was three hours ahead of, uh, of Las Vegas and that nobody was going to wait for Las Vegas to put up the odds um, because of the time difference. So I was ready to go at a house um, outside of Atlantic City and we had some office space and uh, it never happened. It did happen, but it, it happened uh, 
what, how many, 27 years later or something like that, 23, 20, yeah, about 25 years later. So I'm glad I didn't hang around for that for 25 years. So let's fast forward to today then in the U.S., the current U.S. landscape around sports betting. Given the Supreme Court struck down that same law we were talking about, PASPA, the states can now decide, pending any federal legislation, which may or may not happen, probably more likely not to happen. So what would your major piece of advice be to the states who are looking at legalizing sports betting this year? Well, I think you have to go in and realize there's not a lot of revenue in it. Um, People uh, confuse the handle with the amount of revenue. And to make it viable, you have to have a a tax regime um, that allows operators to make money. It's not surprising me that uh, business is being dominated by the people that are already in the in the gambling business, casinos and, and lotteries, because there's just not a lot of money in it. It's pretty hard for standalone companies to just all of a sudden, with no infrastructure, start opening sports books. And also, since all the business is going to eventually migrate to online or apps, there's no sense putting any uh, brick-and-mortar operations up unless you already have a a casino. So I think, you know, the biggest change is obviously is just going to be mostly apps. Um, so my advice is if you, if you want to get, the, you need to make the tax workable for the state, for the players and for the operators. And I think that's since every state has their own tax uh, regime, I think that's the, the part that's hard to get right. And we've seen with Nevada over the years with the changes in the federal excise tax from 10 to 2% to a quarter percent of handle that, Taxation isn't always something that's they get right from the very beginning. No, they don't. There's no question about that. Uh, taxation evolves over the years. There's still, you know, if, if, you, if anybody doubts it, all they have to do is pick up the IRS uh, uh, book, the regulation book, and uh, our tax code. It evolves sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. I, Nevada's really a dream scenario for sports betting operators because we – uh, pay around um, 6.75% of the gross win to the state, and that's it. And there's no um, state corporate tax in Nevada. And uh, businesses run out of casinos, which have good marketing and, and, and good foot traffic. So I, I that's probably still the dr- dream location from a tax basis, but it's limited by population. So that's why sports betting figures to be much more successful, obviously, in much more populous states. So I have a bit of a strange question for you. Let's say you were given the title of United States regular, uh, sorry, Regulator on Sports Betting, or as Andrew Brandt likes to say, the sports betting czar, mm-hmm. and your first item on the agenda is winning bettors or professional bettors that can generally beat the market and, and win longer term. A lot of them, or most of them, seem to be restricted or turned away. What do you think about this topic, and, and what's the, I don't know if there is necessarily an easy solution, but what's the path forward within that space, do you think? Well, I don't think you can regulate whether books take a bet from a customer. I think that's basically a, a marketing decision. I think they're making the wrong decisions. I think that probably nobody should get tossed out. I mean, that I thought the you know, the beauty of betting on apps or betting online is you can limit customers. I don't mean limiting down to $5 where they have to leave, but give everybody the same limit on the app. So let's say in a store, if you're taking over the counter, you're taking 25000 out of, I don't know, let's say an NBA game, you certainly could take 5000 from anybody on an app. And the algorithms are so good now, they, they could show you the customers that are winning and you could move the line more. But... For the easy, the easy way out is to just toss people. I don't think it's viable because it's not like blackjack. If you toss a blackjack player, he can't all of a sudden give his skills to his brother to go in and play. But, you know, if you, if you toss a, a smart better, he can just send somebody else in with the money. So you're going to get the money anyway. You're just not going to know where it's coming from. This is my view. But from a czar's view, I don't think you should uh, uh, regulate how... Um, customers are allowed to bet in the casinos. I think that's over-regulation, overstepping what a sports betting czar should do. I also think that um, it brings up the question that I alluded to earlier, 
and that is that people think that just because they can win betting small, that, that gives them a God-given right to be professional sports bettors. There's lots of people that win betting small. The real secret in the game is scaling, scaling it up. So I think that just because you can grind out a, a profit betting small, I mean, that doesn't make you a professional better. Professional bettors have to go to the next step, the next level. And the next level is figuring out how to scale up your wagers. You can go out of the box um, like I did and buy into a bookmaking operation. That's one way to scale up your wagers. There's other ways. I mean, Billy Walters and Jelko are masters of it. So my, my main thing I would tell players is just because you, you can win betting small, that doesn't entitle you to make a living at it. Probably not the answer they wanted to hear. <laughs> no, no. Well, what, let's say you jumped over to the bookmaking side then, and you're a mm-hmm. sports book manager for for any number of sports books. And you know, the CEO says to you, "Well, if all these betters can't win long term necessarily because of the efficiency of their markets and all these other things, we should let them on." Is that something that factors in at all? Because I talk to a lot of people, and a lot of them say it's so hard to win long term. It's so hard to beat NFL, for example, NFL sides and totals are really really efficient you might have one or two good seasons but over five ten years it's very difficult to to get you know the high 50 percent or even mid 50s to be able to do that wouldn't that be in the interest of the bookmakers to keep even those that are winning initially to limit them and keep their action and then ultimately if they do regress back to whatever the mean might be for them around 50 percent they can then you know make a, a winning business long term for themselves yeah, I think what you, you answered the, you asked the question, you answered. I think you're, you're right, but the the NFL, where the results are a little bit more random um, compared to something like college basketball, it's already made, it's already adjusted in the limit in the limits. So the limit in the NFL football for a lot of places is just just how much cash you can bring in. And everybody has a smaller limits on college basketball and even smaller limits on college basketball totals. So that's a, that's a part. That's one thing that we, at Las Vegas Sports Consultants, what we try to do is sh- show people that um, um, with limits, you, can, you sh- should be managing uh, the players. Uh, without limits, players manage you. And that's why different sports, you take different amounts of, of money on it. Uh, that's why hardly anybody ever turns down a suit. Nobody turns on a Super Bowl bet. But once again, they have limits on their proposition bets because um, they're, uh, it's been proven that guys that are smarter can win on them. I, I think the books have done a really good job in uh, adjusting their limits to the type of market they're getting over time. But that's, that's something that's taken 20 years. In fact, when I left the business, they still weren't very good at it. They couldn't, you know, they were taking the same limit on a NBA game, on a, you know, what they were on a baseball game as, you know, they were on a college football game, which I never could understand. But I think they've got good at, at that over the years is realizing that there are some sports where the results are more random and the, and the line is more accurate, whether it's a result of the way the game is played or the scores, and they've made that adjustment. What would it take for an exchange or an exchange or a group of exchanges coming to the U.S. to work? Do you think there's any inherent limitations with the U.S. market, or do you think it's just a wire act thing? And if that gets sorted out in the future and it can be pooled liquidity, there's a, a future. Oh, there's a tremendous future to pooled liquidity. There's probably a future if New York or California ever get legalized uh, statewide uh, sports betting, or, or well, Texas not very likely, uh, but. Places with large populations uh, could do it. Otherwise, um, the way the law is written right now is uh, the pools aren't going to be large enough, I don't think, to, to make it viable. The interesting thing about betting exchanges, and I've never, I've struggled with this for a long time with people in the in the industry talking about it. It seems like it's it's just been a winner take all business that there haven't been competitive. I know it's the question of betting exchanges is all about liquidity. But even if you have a company like Betfair that has a pretty high tax rate, you know, for consistent winners, they still basically are writing, you know, probably doing over 90% of the world's exchange betting, which I've, I've, it's mystified me. There, it hasn't been more of a competitive market. 
Um, uh, when it starts in the United States, I don't think it'll be that competitive either, just for the reason that uh, there won't be enough liquidity in the pools. But after a lot of liquidity, you would think there would be the market would support two, three, four viable exchanges. It hasn't, though. Yeah, no, no, you're right. So switching over a little bit now, professional bettors, what things have you observed over the years that make them long-term successful bettors? Being a professional better is a moving target. So just because you did something last year doesn't mean or work next year. So they're basically up being able to update their data. It's just a data game now. It's an algorithm game. And when they find an edge, they're comfortable with betting as much money as they can, they can get down, which is what I talked about earlier, scaling it up. Uh, basically, there's, not, there's hardly anybody that I know that, wins at every sport. So, I don't, you know, you think, well, once people develop these algorithms, they should be able to do this and do that, but it's like horse racing. Uh, some of the smartest uh, guys, algo guys in the world that haven't been able to win in Hong Kong or guys that win in Hong Kong don't win in Australia. And it seems to me in sports betting there's people that do really well on some sports and not so well on the others, and the professionals know the sports that they're, um, they just don't have it right. Uh, or they still need some more fine tuning. I think that's their biggest strength. For a lot of people, they just need to be in action every day of the year, and I, I don't, you know, that's not, that's really not a, a way to be a professional better. So, what can you share about the KGs or the known gamblers? Ah, well, that's one of the fun parts of my life. Um, a buddy of mine, Walt Tendler, he uh, was watching a softball game, and uh, a guy in his thirties playing he just dropped dead of a heart attack a fit guy and uh, it's a sad story but good came out of it um he said you know this is unbelievable we don't know when our time's going to be why don't we just make a bucket list of racetracks we want to visit around the world and start doing them and so for the last uh, 19 years we've been going to these race venues around around the world that have included uh the Preakness Stakes, the Breeders' Cup a couple of times, uh, Royal Ascot, uh, Irish Derby, uh, Dubai World Cup, um, some others I'm not remembering right now. And our, our spiritual home seems to be in Melbourne right now because we're getting a lot older and some of, some of the guys don't travel as well as we used to. Uh, but we still make these pilgrimages and even to small tracks too. And KG's is... Uh, came from a, a police term in the old days when uh, your file, if it had written KG on it, it was you were a known gambler. So we, we, we stole that uh, from the police department, KG, and <laughs> we called it the, the KG Club. So we've got, last year the Melbourne Cup, I think we had people show up from seven different countries that are, that are members. Um, UK, uh, Ireland, uh, Thailand, Canada, USA, Australia, at six, maybe, oh, Hong Kong, seven, there we are. So how does, how does the Melbourne Carnival compare to what you've seen around the world? I'm sure you've probably got a soft spot for places like, you know, Del Mar, that track down on the, mm -hmm. the coast, and then even, you know, the Preakness and the Belmont and how that's sort of changed over the years. But what, what, there's a lot of people in Melbourne who listen or, who've been to the Melbourne Cup Carnival, what can you say about that from an international perspective? I think it's the best week of fun. I, probably the best week of racing is the Royal Ascot, but the problem with Ascot, it, it's five days in a row, and it just hits you, hits you, hits you, hits you, and I don't see, between the parties and the, uh, I don't see how you can get up in the morning and take the train out there every, all five days. <laughs> so <laughs> if I go to Ascot, I only go a couple of days. I like the spacing in Melbourne. You have the great the best race uh, card on Saturday and you get Sunday and Monday off. Not that you're really off because you're going to parties and the call of a cup and this and that. And, um, and then, you know, of course, Tuesday you have the big race and then you get a day, you get a hangover day on Wednesday. And actually Rob Waterhouse hosts a, uh, for the KGs hosts a, uh, recovery breakfast on that Wednesday. Uh, Thursday we have, uh, Ladies' Day, Oaks Day, and then we get another Hangover Day Friday in which uh, I have a luncheon. <laughs> and then you have uh, Saturday Racing, which is really for the people that manage to hack it out for the whole week. I saw, I call it like, uh, it's sort of like Die Hard's Day. And then 
Sunday, Sunday, every, everybody travels home and needs about a week to recover because the one thing about the Aussies is uh, I put them top of the world for drinkers. <laughs> so they don't have a problem starting early and they don't have a problem finishing late. So I really have to pace myself when I'm down there. <laughs> well, a lot of them who are listening to this can probably relate and they're probably <laughs> thinking, why don't you stay for Sandown, which is, I think, the week later. But no, there's there's certainly a lot of uh, a lot of people that enjoy the carnival. I guess one last question for you, Roxy, and it's been fun chatting. We could probably do two or three hours, but I'll I'll keep it to one more. What's what's next for you? What do you want to achieve in the next few years? Is it just continuing up the kgs, or is there anything else on your radar? Well, I'm happy with traveling to racetracks as a social event because this, I haven't done any racing work in a long, long time as far as gambling goes. Uh, so I'm happy to do this as a social thing. I'm, I'm sort of intrigued by the uh, amount of um, algorithmic guys and mathematicians getting into English football. I think it's very slow uh, for that to happen. The markets are growing pretty efficiently or much more efficiently. Um, and I, I, it's just a hobby for me, but I really enjoy seeing how uh, baseball's always been the uh, mathematician's uh, darling for, for data, and and so is cricket, but you know, in America, they've taken baseball to different levels with uh, evaluating every player and adding up the components for a team, and um, I think it's finally coming to a soccer now, and it's just interesting. The guys who are doing the work aren't better. The guys that are doing the work are just guys that are hobbyists, like what happened in the States with baseball. And the data they're producing, a lot of it's noise, but they're producing some amazing data. And I'm a big believer on these adjusted uh, uh, goals formulas. And because I've looked at English football for a long time, and I've always thought the flaw was looking at possession because. Possession is a function of the score. It's not the reason for the score. And that, that was good for me <laughs> because everybody got it wrong. But these guys are a lot smarter now, and they're making the market a lot harder. I'm just glad I'm, re- I'm a retired uh, a hobbyist better instead of a pro. But that's, that's, that's what makes me get up and look at, still look at math every day. Very interesting. Roxy, thank you very much for your time. I very much appreciate you coming on the podcast and sharing some of your experience and insights. Oh, my pleasure, Jake.